So good morning and welcome. My name is Elisa Lacozzi and I'm the pastor to the beloved community that is Guilford Community Church. I'm so glad you have joined us this morning for this service of word and sacrament, as well as our celebration of the greatest church potluck in history. It's true. You'll hear more about that during the sermon. I want to extend a special greeting to those of you who are worshiping with us on YouTube this morning. Thank you for being here. And although you're not here in person, we feel your spirit with us and we hope that you feel our spirit with you as well. I want to just remind you that our relaunch team is working hard to begin taking the steps needed to make our church building as safe as it can be so we can look with excitement towards a time when we may be able to gather indoors together again. For now, however, let us lean into the joy of being together in all the many ways that we can. Let us gather worshiping God, offering prayers in our hearts and reflecting on God's word to us this day. Let us keep creating new ways of being church because we know that being the church has nothing to do with the building and everything to do with loving each other. And I believe we have a special intro this morning with the We'd whole like to, uh, family. <laughs> I know you know Stefan, who lives in Brattleboro. Sam lives in London, and he's here for a few weeks. So we're very happy to have him join his us. Beth here. And, right and, and there's Beth, Beth Orton, his wife. Uh, it's an old favorite. I gotta do it like that. Yeah. Like, Whoa, Jesus! Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done. What you've me. done for me, Jesus! Jesus, I'll never, I'll never forget. forget. You set my, you set my soul, soul, free. soul so free, Jesus! Jesus, I'll, I'll never, never forget. forget. How you brought How me you brought up. Me up. Oh, well, no, 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 I'll never forget. Well, you've been my friend. Done to me. Done to me. That's what you've done for me. Done for me. Done for me. That's what you've done for me. Done for me. Done for me. That's what you've done for me. Took my feet out of my repair. I'll never forget. Whoa, now Jesus. Jesus, I'll never forget. What you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget. You set my soul so free. Jesus, I'll never forget. That's what you done for me. Done for me. Done for me. That's what you done for me. 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 That's what you done for me. Done for me. Done for me. You took my feet out of miry clay and I'll never forget. Whoa, now Jesus. Jesus, I'll never forget. What you done for me. What you done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget. You set my soul so free. So free. Jesus, Jesus, I'll forget. never forget how you brought, how me, you brought me out. Oh, well, no, 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 I'll never forget. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done. What yes, you've done for me. Jesus, Jesus I'll, never I'll never forget. You set my, you set my soul, soul, soul free. free. Jesus, Jesus I'll, I'll never forget how you brought, how you brought me out. Oh, well, no, 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 I'll never So if you're at home and have a candle, I invite you to get that now to light it and join with us as we light our candle here. As we gather today, let us be grateful for our very lives, for this breath in our lungs in which we praise God, with which we can connect with the Holy Spirit, Ruha, and know that God is with us. Let us join together now in the call to worship found printed in your bulletin. Only the hungry search for bread. Only the thirsty look for water. This is a place for those who are hungry and thirsty in spirit. 
Only those who ache for meaning will pursue it. Only those who yearn for a deeper life will seek it. This is a place for those who ache and yearn for something more. So let us come here today with our hunger and thirst, our unsatisfied longings, our heartfelt yearnings. Let us come here today. Our first hymn this morning is Bosald, by, written by Anne Bosald, words by Isaac Watts. Thank you, choir. Our opening prayer, our prayer of invocation this morning is a short piece by the poet David White, who some of you may be familiar with. It's entitled Loaves and Fishes. This is not the age of information. This is not the age of information. Forget the news and the radio and the blurred screen. This is the time of loaves and fishes. People are hungry and one good word is bread for a thousand. Family of faith, this is the time where I invite us to take a moment to reflect. Reflect on all the ways that we maybe need healing, the ways in which we are broken and imperfect because we all are. So I invite you to say this prayer of brokenness along with me. Gracious God, provider of all we need, we are often content to rely on our own devices, our creativity, our cleverness. We congratulate ourselves for our accomplishments, yet we find that these achievements and acquisitions do not fill the deep hunger inside of us. We long for the spirit bread whom you alone can provide. Forgive us, merciful God. Help us receive your blessings you offer, that we may be your bread for the world. Blessed 
broken for all. Hear these words of assurance. Hear the good news. God's merciful mercy is plentiful. God's grace is abundant. Receive the bread of forgiveness and steadfast love. Amen. So having the tense turn this way makes this a little bit easier for you. I have to turn back this way. The kids are currently enjoying a little snack with Ellen at the table. So I invite you to, yeah, wave, outstretch your hand, if you will, and join with me in singing this blessing to them. As you journey, journey, may you know, may you know, love and hope grow with you, love and hope grow with you wherever you go. Whenever you go. <laughs> Abundant blessings. I love it. Wonderful. Thank you. So today's children's hymn, I had never heard this before. Peter turned me on to it. And it's, have you ever, had you heard it before? It was, it's great. It's a great piece. It's called Jesus Feeds 5000, but it's much zippier than that. So enjoy. And I have to tell you that on the YouTube where I found this, it was from some organization that creates um, great you know, Christian songs for children. It said this one was geared to two-year-olds.
don't know about the rest of you, but I'm going to be singing that all day. Maybe into tomorrow even. We have two readings this morning. The first from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. It will be read for us this morning by Herb Meyer. The lesson for Ephesians reads this way. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or to imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The second reason is from John. Verses, chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and he saw a large, a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for all these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley, barley loads and two fish. But what are they among all these people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there is a great deal of grass in the place. So they sat down by about 5,000 of them. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Our first anthem this morning is Love is Little. It's a 19th century Shaker hymn, and it was arranged for us by Andy Davis.
Holy Spirit is running through here wreaking some havoc this morning, eh? Thank you, Lucy. It was during World War II. Times were hard. Really hard. A teenager was riding in a crowded train compartment with five strangers. His mother had given him a sandwich wrapped in a handkerchief for his lunch because rationing made food for travelers hard to come by. Noon came and he was hungry, but he didn't want to eat his lunch in front of the other passengers. He decided to wait until they got out their lunches, but no one moved. An hour passed, then another, Finally, his stomach was rumbling and he decided he had no choice. He needed to eat, and so did others sharing his compartment. He reached in his coat pocket and took out the handkerchief. He spread it on his lap and carefully broke his sandwich into six pieces while the other passengers watched in silence. Then he said a brief blessing and gave each passenger a part of his sandwich. Then everyone else reached into their pockets and bags and took out the food they had brought and not wanted to eat in front of others who might have nothing. The food was broken and shared around the compartment with a sense of feasting. Stories and laughter were shared along with the food. I invite you to pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, loving and gracious God. Amen. There are two ways to live. You can live as if nothing is a miracle, and you can live as if everything is a miracle. Do you have any guesses as to who might have said that quote? And if you know, please give people a second to guess. Does anybody know, actually know for sure? Fred Rogers. What was that? Fred Rogers. No. <laughs> That's right. It was Albert Einstein. Now, I don't know about you, but that was pretty shocking to me, right? Arguably one of the most important scientists of the 20th century said that about miracles. Does that strike anybody else as kind of odd or ironic? <laughs> The man who dedicated his entire life to proving the existence of things gave us this powerful quote about things that can't be proven. Miracles. Now the sermon illustration story I just shared gives one possible explanation as to how our gospel story unfolds. But for time immemorial, 
This gospel story, which appears in all four gospels, and remember there's only 10 stories that do that, has been categorized as a miracle story. Jesus tells the disciples, don't send these people away, scrounge around and see what we have, and then watch me perform a magic trick of the century. It's a reasonable explanation, given that Jesus does in fact perform other miracles, changing water into wine, healing people who are sick, even raising people from the dead. Those are some big miracles. So it doesn't seem at all far-fetched to think that here's just another one, another way for Jesus to show off his savior skills. Now, we live in a world that is so logically minded that we don't know how to live into mystery. We don't know how to let miracles be miracles. I have read many scholarly reports trying to debunk this story as a miracle. After all, there has to be some reasonable explanation, right? So this isn't actually a miracle story. It's historic record of the very first and greatest church potluck. Right? You remember those church potlucks? When, you know, nothing is really organized, but there seems to be more than enough food for everybody who shows up, even though there's no head count of who's coming. One of my favorite possible explanations of this miracle event is um, in the telling, all the tellings agree, all four agree that there were five loaves and two fish, but they were at the Sea of Galilee. So what if those fish were something huge, <laughs> like whale size? The revised visual on this makes me both chuckle and cringe. You and 4,999 of your closest friends gathered in a gigantic circle feasting on Shamu. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there are some possible explanations. However, if we leave it there, we ignore the deeper teaching and perhaps miss the real miracle of the story. Within the first two lines of this version of the gospel story, we hear that Jesus had compassion for the people. The miracle starts with compassion. And what is compassion? It is defined as concern for the suffering or misfortunes of others. Compassion embodies a tangible expression of love for those who are suffering. Now, it doesn't say that Jesus poured out compassion on them because they were hungry, per se. It seems that many of them were sick and had heard he was a healer. So perhaps they were hungry for some healing, for some care, or someone to just give a damn. And Jesus went and cured them. No questions asked. Then he went beyond that, not just caring for their great suffering, but also for their most basic needs. Notice Jesus doesn't look upon this crowd, many of whom had clearly traveled a long way to see and hear him, to perhaps be healed by him and think, they didn't prepare very well. Who goes on a long, long trip to a deserted place and doesn't pack something to eat? He didn't say that. Likely he didn't even think it. The disciples didn't know what to do with this big hungry crowd. All they could come up with is to send them away to find something to eat for themselves. This response makes it seem that the disciples are not concerned enough to get involved. But more than likely, they were feeling overwhelmed. A huge hungry crowd overpowered their sense of agency. They only saw their powerlessness in the face of a large scaled need. I don't know about you, but I can certainly relate to that feeling. Perhaps there was also some part of them that didn't want to see the need at all because it made them too uncomfortable. So therefore, send them away. Out of sight, out of mind. Too often we want to send away those things that make us too uncomfortable. 
but Jesus always responds by drawing nearer to those uncomfortable situations, by going towards the suffering. Give them something to eat, Jesus says, and their response, we have nothing. Now, it is true what they had was meager. They described it as nothing, though. But that's not true. They did have something. Perhaps it was only a little bit, someone's leftover from a previous meal. Maybe we can relate to that feeling too right now. It feels like there's only a little left of church. We don't really have the building anymore. So many other activities that make it truly feel like church still haven't resumed. For many, there's little left that is recognizable of life that we had before the pandemic. There is little ability left to not see the suffering that has been caused by systemic racism this country was founded upon. But is there really nothing? What is left over? There is one thing that can't ever be taken away, no matter what the circumstance. That's God's love for you. And what can you make with those leftovers? So what might have really happened here? What's the real miracle? Perhaps the miracle comes in the form of a little boy who offers the fishes and loaves in the first place. If that's all you have left to eat till God knows when, how freely would you give and share that with a crowd sizable enough to clearly leave you with nothing afterwards? This angle on the passage made famous by the great commentator and theologian William Barclay. Barclay suggests that the miracle may be simply explained as the crowd seeing the generosity and trust of the small lad sharing his lunch themselves becoming moved to pull their resources to the point of abundance in 12 baskets of leftovers. Something like the story I began with. What might have compelled the boy to share his food? Perhaps he couldn't do math. By that, I mean his reasoning mind hadn't yet gotten the best of him. His imagination allowed him to make the offer beyond what reason would dictate is possible. The poet Rilke said, this is the miracle that happens every time those who really love give more, give more than they can possess. Most Bibles gives a heading to this story that reads something like Jesus feeds the 5,000, like the kids song we just heard. Actually, Jesus gives food only to the disciples who then feed others. Our call is to active ministry that meets human needs and responds to those who are suffering. Jesus feeds 12, Jesus feeds us, and we in turn are called to feed others. So what then is the real miracle of this story? The real miracle is seeing abundance instead of scarcity. It is seeing that we have the power to change a desperate situation if we are willing to let our hearts be changed. The miracle is seeing a situation that would disperse us instead of draw us together and connects us even into a deeper communion with one another. The miracle is realizing that you are calling forth the kingdom of God every time you are generous with one another, not just with your material possessions. No, even more so when you are generous with your heart. You are creating a place where all can be fed and nurtured. So come, come and get fed. There is more than enough, even enough for you. Be compassionate toward one another. Be generous and take care of one another. May God grant you hearts to see the suffering of others and to respond 
with compassion. May God give us the ability to see possibility where others see nothing. May we be generous with the abundance that we have, both in our pockets and our hearts. May we embrace the power and ability that we have to do something and make a difference in the lives of those who are suffering, to be Christ to the suffering world. Amen. Today's pastoral prayer is, of course, from Jan Richardson, entitled, Blessings of Enough. I know how small this blessing seems, just a morsel that hardly matches the sharp hunger you carry inside. But trust me when I say, though I can scarcely believe it myself, that between and behind and beneath these words, there is a space where a table has been laid, a feast has been prepared, all has been made ready for you, and it will be enough and more. Amen. Our second anthem this morning is Still There Is Love, a poem by Edith Newland Chase with music by our own Mary Alice Amidon and arranged by Peter. So it just occurred to me that before service started, I didn't find out who's reading the prayers of the people. Ah, the mystery person has revealed himself. Mr. Donham, thank you. Friends, this is the time in our service where I invite your prayers. Prayers of concern or sorrow, prayers of celebration or joy. If you have something or someone you would like our gathering to pray for, I invite you to type it in the comments section that accompanies this live feed. Our prayers of the people this morning is obviously being read and led by Dunham Rowley. Good morning, everyone. 
Holy God, bless our lives, sanctify us, and in your way grant us our heart's desire. Anoint with your grace, anoint us with your grace, that we desire that what we desire is also what you desire. Help us to understand that our heart's true desire is the love of you. May the love of Christ urge us on. May we walk by faith. Thank you, God, for all of our blessings. Holy God, bless those who govern. Bless the leaders of nations, countries, towns, cities, and those who lead in all manner, social, political, religious. Bless us all. Fill the hearts of all with your wisdom. Guide us in the way of justice and integrity for all. Guide us to walk by faith. Holy God, to those who suffer in mind, body, and spirit, tend to the tired, the dying, the poor, and the hungry. Help us to follow the love of Christ, a love which urges us on. Help us to seek and serve Christ and others, bringing forth a new creation. Holy God, we ask this in the name of Christ, our Redeemer. Holy God, we ask that, ask all this by the Holy Spirit who activates your love in us. Holy God, we ask all this that your love may be like seeds scattered, manifesting in small and unexpected ways the greatness of you. May your love take root in our lives. May we walk by faith. Now let us say to, together the prayer that Jesus taught us, using whatever words help us to embody his, its promise. May we bring about one small glimpse of the kingdom of God, a kingdom where all are well, all are fed and free, where all are whole, where all know love, where all know they are beloved. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now. Amen. Like to add to those prayers, Perrin just told me that her father is returned to the hospital this morning, so I invite you to offer prayers for Perrin's dad. My friends, remind God, dear God, remind me to share whatever is in my basket today. You will do the rest. Friends, this is a time when we offer our gifts what we have in our basket. I invite you to do that now or to do that as you have been by sending your offerings to 38 Church Drive in Guilford. Or if you're joining us online, you can go to our homepage and click the PayPal donation button to make an offering to our online collection plate. So let us now gather up all these offerings, as well as the offerings of our time and our talents, and dedicate them to continuing the work of bringing about God's justice in the world.
Let us say this prayer of dedication together. On my own, what I have to give doesn't amount to much in light of all you have given to me and in the face of so much need. Put together as a congregation, what we offer you here in love becomes more, not simply added together, but somehow multiplied in its usefulness. We ask that you bless our gifts and with the addition of your blessing, just as it was with the loaves and fishes, there is enough for all. Amen. So I invite you now to turn to your neighbor and offer them a sign of peace. And if you are potted and comfortable, you can shake a hand if you'd like. But I'm fond of using the sign language, right? Which is peace. This is another first moment for us. So I just want to take a minute to take it in. I always call the spirit of my grandmother to the table when I offer communion because she fed me so well while she was alive and not just with the amazing homemade pasta and bread, but with a whole lot of love. Christ's invitation is simple. Sit down where you are. You don't need to run off somewhere else. Not a nearby village market or a familiar sanctuary. Communion is where you are. Sit down. The disciples complained, it is a deserted place and the hour is late. Jesus said, they need not go away. No one needs to go away. No one is deserted and no one is late. Not you who are alone because you are vulnerable to a virus or you who feel alone even in a not distancing crowd because something has made your life a wilderness. Jesus has compassion on every crowd, healing them even the hungers, one by one by one. Here is green grass. Someone to help you sit down. Someone to help you stand up again. Someone to bless communion. That's all of us, by the way. So it will be enough. Break it into pieces you can handle. Sit down where you are. In the story about feeding a multitude, Jesus asked that people bring to him what they had. You have done that today. Your hearts, your prayers, your songs. You have done that today in your kitchens, in your living rooms and dining rooms as you join us online. So if you are there at home, I invite you to rest your hands lightly on these elements, which we, you have set aside today to be sacrament. And if you are here with us, I invite you to stretch out your hands as we ask God's blessing on all of these elements to make them enough and also to make them abundant for us and all those in our prayers this morning.
God of compassion, you bless and break everything you are and everything we bring to you. Our deep scarcity becomes enough to sustain us and then our enough becomes an abundance we could never imagine. We pray that your spirit of life and love, of tenderness and power, rest upon every bread and every cup, that they may feed the inmost need of each child of God and pour forth a grace that can change the world. Christ at our table we remember. We remember our tabling at Martha's kitchen and the beach fish fry at homes of self-righteous or the disrespected. We remember a wedding made more festive. And we pray for every human relationship. We remember loaves and fish. And we pray for places where there is no food. We remember Passover when we washed feet, shared gravy with a betrayer and sang a hymn. And we pray for all who need to learn how to serve or to be served, how to turn away from temptation or open up to a song, not only vocalized, but heart music. We remember all tables from cathedrals to campgrounds where your children have gathered to eat bread or tortilla, rice cake or cassava. And we lift into your love five-star churches and down on their luck holy diners. We communion the remembrance of saints in all times and places and lift before you those we have loved from the past, our saints who need healing, comfort for loss, guidance in decisions, peace in living, and many others in whom the yeast has not yet risen, though they may feel punched down. Christ, yours is the wheat and yours the grapes. Yours is the leaven and the love. Rest your spirit on this place of prayer and party, in person and online. Shine your blessing on every face, now and every, wherever food is offered. This is the feast of your heart rehearsed. Eating this bread, we break each curse. Drinking this cup, we do not thirst. Amen. So communion will go this way. Your deacons will come around and serve you a piece of bread. We'll ask that everybody hold it and we will take it together as one body and we'll do the same with the cup. All is ready and all are welcome. bread on your table is blessed and broken like the picnic of grace. Sharing love, we will never hunger.
The cup on your table is blessed and shared like the overflowing of tears and joy. Even a sip is drinking deeply. And thanksgiving for the meal that heals yesterday and the unexpected grace that empowers tomorrow. We pray for the wisdom to give away as fast as possible some 12 baskets of leftovers. We give you thanks, O Christ, for gathering us at all our tables for your word of life and sacred banquet as we part from one another with the leftovers of your love turn our being fed and blessed into holy takeout and share what we receive slowly sweetly and surely with all your children amen our closing hymn this morning is rooted and grounded in love and it's written by my dear friend amanda udis kessler Amen. 
So my, my friends, receive this blessing for your week. As you go into your coming week, may your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. As you go into this week, may you see what little you have as the very thing the world might need right now. May you come to know how wide, how long, how high and how deep God's love for you really is. All glory to God who is able to accomplish infinitely more than we could ever dare to ask or imagine. Go with God. So we have just a couple of announcements. I know Dunham, where did you go? Come on up. Well, what a gift it was today to get this sermon. Oh my gosh. Jesus said, give them something to eat. We have that opportunity, guys. And the beginning, the beginning days of September, the Guilford Fair, remember this? We need your leftover. No, not your leftovers. <laughs> we need your 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 contributions, your donations of food, your donations of time. Um, keep thinking. Um, Labor Day weekend, please. I'll have the sign up sheets over here. I'm not the LA of, of yesterday, but I'm the LA of today. So um, we need your, and, and um, Sherry Ann Broadhurst and I are organizing this. So um, we really look forward to working with you. This is our first attempt to, to, to come forward and be present among the, the, the people and the children of Guilford. So um, God's love for us is within us and we need to feed the people we think loaves well buns and hamburgers and hot dogs uh, loaves and fishes were back then now we're thinking hot dogs and hamburgers thank you my height poses a challenge to peter every sunday <laughs> Maybe I should just get a little box to step up on. That might make it easier. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say one more quick word. Again, thank you for being willing to mask. Um, I know it feels like overkill outside, but we are in close quarters. I just wanted to let people know that we are going to continue what we've been doing, which is if you need to come to the church or something, if you could let myself or Deborah, who is the new uh, church administrator, know, and that would be a great way to get to know her and I'm going to ask people to please mask indoors. So again, I thank you for um, perhaps uh, tolerating me with all this, but as you can imagine, um, 18 months of feeling responsible for the safety of a community is pretty wearing. So any help you can give me, I'd really appreciate it. No, well, thank you. Um, so we have another really important announcement, Andy, can you uh, come forward to help with this one? Um, as Andy's coming forward, I wanted to just say, um, as I mentioned, that we have a new church administrator, but we have one who has been with us for four years and um, needs to be amply thanked. So I'm just going to start. <laughs> you stay right there. I'm going to just kick it off by saying um, publicly, Patty, I could not have made this transition without you. In the most challenging of situations, the most challenging of situations, I was so blessed that you were there and you were an anchor for me. Yeah, right back at you, thank you. Andy. So we need the choir to come up. What better way to thank Patty Meyer, then through song. 
something that she does all the time. And you can just sit there. You don't have to play. I might ask you for a note, though. <laughs> You'll recognize the, the music, but the words are brand new. World premiere. Is there a G chord on that keyboard? Yeah. Yeah. In our church there is an office filled with files wall to wall. There you'll find our Patty Meyer working hard for one and all. Patty Meyer, Patty Meyer, thank you for the job you do. Ha <laughs> ha! 